So uh, the last of our survey of extraintestinal manifestations today involves the lungs, which is not something we think about, I think, enough. And that's the whole point of this, to get you folks all thinking outside the intestine. So uh, these are my disclosures again. I do want to give a shout out to one person, Alicia Casey, who is our pulmonologist at Boston Children's, absolutely wonderful resource for us, who's helped us on so many of these difficult patients and all the case reports you'll hear about today are from our practice that Alicia and I have managed. So just like Dr. Long suggests, I think people should look at the overall approach of when someone has lung involvement, what categories can you break it into? And one category is lung involvement that might occur anyway if the patient was healthy without IBD. In other words, you have a bronchial like this that's very nice and thin, a good airway, and then when you get asthma or chronic bronchitis, it becomes chronically inflamed, and then over time, you can even develop fibrosis just like you would in the bowel. So again, people who are healthy can get lung disease, asthma, COPD, community-acquired pneumonia, all different. But then there are specific forms of lung involvement that are associated with inflammatory bowel disease. I'm going to review pulmonary function abnormalities, pulmonary nodules, and also interstitial lung disease, which can be complications of the IBD itself. Lung disease from medications is another category. Aminosalicylates, for example, thiopurines, methotrexate, can all cause interstitial pneumonitides. And then the most feared group of problems are the lung diseases from opportunistic infections, including tuberculosis, atypical MTB, histoplasmosis, Legionella and pneumocystis. So first an overview of pulmonary function testing. Remember this from medical school. You've got your spirometer here. You breathe in and out normally. And then when you do pulmonary function testing, you're asked to take a very deep breath and they measure the inspiration. And then you're asked to blow it out very quickly all the way to the bottom. And basically, the difference between this area and this area is called your total lung capacity. And then how quickly you can blow out a breath, which is a measure of bronchial inflammation, is your forced expiratory volume at one second, or FEV1. So vital capacity is basically a measure of how much lung tissue you have. Do you have one lung? Do you have parenchymal damage and other things? FEV1 is a measure of basically how quickly you can blow things out which is a measure of your bronchial thickness. And then the other test that's done in pulmonary function tests is called the diffusing capacity of carbon monoxide, or DLCO. What do they do with that? Basically, you blow in a very small amount of carbon monoxide, and it gets into the alveoli. And normally, that carbon monoxide is going to get into the blood vessel. But if you have interstitial lung disease or parenchymal disease, the carbon monoxide can't get across. So this is a good measure for decreased alveolar function or interstitial lung disease. So why are these important? It's because they help distinguish between different types of lung disease. So obstructive lung disease like asthma, the lungs actually themselves, their tissue is fine, so your vital capacity is normal or reduced. It's the airways that are narrow, so you can't blow things out as quickly. And your FEV1 is actually reduced. And paradoxically, I don't know exactly why that is, DLCO can actually be increased. In restrictive disease, like for example, emphysema, both your vital capacity and your FEV1 are reduced. So you've got less lung and you don't blow things out as well. And then for interstitial lung disease, you get reduced vital capacity, but also this decreased ability for carbon monoxide to diffuse. So all of these tests give you different information. <clears throat> now, the reason why this is important is even at baseline, pulmonary function tests in inflammatory bowel patients may be abnormal. So it's important that you understand these. This is a nice study actually out of China that looked at a group of 64 adults with IBD. The key caveat and why they're different from children is they're Chinese patients and 50% were smokers. But their mean BMI was 25. They weren't terribly overweight. They were young. So in other ways, they're similar children. They were newly diagnosed and no pulmonary symptoms at all. And they excluded patients with abnormal chest X-rays or CTs. So at least on the surface, these patients look normal. 
Well, but look what you saw, 50 to 60% instance of PFT abnormalities compared to controls, also who were smokers, by the way. FEV1, 15% lower than in controls, lower DLCO, and they noted that patients with active IBD are more likely to have abnormalities in their pulmonary function tests. So again, you may have abnormal PFTs and it may correlate to disease activity. Now, does this apply to children? It's more controversial. Basically, one paper said yes, one paper said no. I'm going to highlight the negative study because it's good that negative studies get in the literature. And this was a prospective study of 30 children with IBD. They'd had it for at least 3.2 years, 32 age matched controls. Their mean age was 14. And again, they noticed no difference in vital capacity, FEV1 or DLCO. However, the study may be underpowered. They didn't really have as many patients with active disease. So this is the healthy group. This is the UC group. This is the Crohn's group. Not big differences in that. But again, worth thinking about in another area where we really need more data, larger sample size. So now I'm going to move on to specific patients with specific conditions. So here's an asymptomatic patient with abnormal findings. She's a 17-year-old girl. She has Crohn's of the ileum and colon. The family was very resistant to medication use. She kind of hung on for a while. They finally went to a thiopurine for a little while, but it was really too little, too late. She underwent ileocecectomy, and actually she still had residual active disease, was not doing that well on the thiopurine. So we talked about consideration of anti-TNF therapy. The only issue was that early on in her course, she'd had an abdominal CT, and they nicked the bottom of the lungs when they were doing the abdominal CT, and they say, oh, she's got a pulmonary nodule. And so when we repeated that study at this time, she once again had this pulmonary nodule, and she'd had a history of pulmonary nodules since diagnosis with negative PPDs. So what does this actually mean? So we did a full evaluation. We did quantifiron. Pulmonary function tests were normal except for the low DLCO, perhaps again, remember, some PFTs can be abnormal in patients with Crohn's. And she went to lavage because she were worried. She had some nonspecific inflammation, but infectious studies, AFB and fungal cultures were negative. Her biopsy was deferred. She was given anti-TNF. She ultimately did well. And on follow-up, the nodules have persisted on follow-up CT scans, but they basically have not changed. They haven't gotten any worse. And interestingly, after treatment of her IBD, the DLCO has now normalized. So this case actually, we believe, is a case of Crohn's disease of the lung. And there's a very nice uh, CPC from the Mass General Hospital, you know, those CPCs that appear from the New England Journal of Medicine. Jess Kaplan is the clinician speaking about it where they actually went to biopsy one of these patients and they had granulomatous inflammation of the lung or so-called necrobiotic nodules. That's the term they use for Crohn's disease of the lung. Granulomas in the lung parenchyma, and this patient also had more lung inflammation with boop. c anca test, which is a test that we often use for Wegener's, is negative. You have to distinguish this from infection or drug toxicity. But the key is this kind of lung disease can respond to anti-TNF treatment. So here's case two, ulcerative colitis status post-surgery. And this is a young man with ulcerative colitis, unresponsive to multiple medicines, including ASA, thiopurines, infliximab, vedolizumab. He underwent surgery. He also had significant lung disease in it as an infant. He was premature. He had tracheomalacia, and he had bronchopulmonary dysplasia. But even before the surgery, he had chronic cough that was resulted in referral for PFTs prior to surgery. He had a history of asthma, and his PFTs were quite abnormal. We were hoping that after colectomy, he might get better, but he did not. His cough and his lung function abnormalities persisted. So his evaluation basically showed a CT scan that didn't show a whole lot, okay, but he had uh, on lung biopsy bronchopneumonia, interstitial pneumonitis, non necrotizing granulomas. He had a few tiny pulmonary nodules, you can't even see them there. And his pulmonary function tests have persistent despite corticosteroids. He actually is thought to have 
some form of IBD-associated interstitial pneumonitis, possibly immune-mediated, and so the management actually from our pulmonologist was to restart infliximab. Now, he has non-necrotizing granulomas in his lung. Does that mean that he has Crohn's? The truth is I don't know. He didn't have any granulomas or any sign of Crohn's in his colon. Do granulomas in the lung equal uh, Crohn's disease? The truth is we really don't know. I don't see this as a contraindication with pouch, but it's something we have to think about over time. Here's another girl, Crohn disease on anti-TNF treatment. She's 16. She had disease that was very UC-like with pancolonic disease, but she had a handful of granulomas at different times. She did well for several years on amino salicylates with rare corticosteroid pulses, but then she eventually broke through. She got pancreatitis on mercaptopurine. Methotrexate didn't touch her. And then ultimately we added in infliximab and she went on methotrexate and infliximab for two years. She presented very acutely with fever, cough, joint pains, and muscle pains. And when we got a chest x-ray, we said, wow, she had this very big pleural effusion at this point in time. She was short of breath. She had a high CRP. Sputum culture was negative. T-spot was negative. And ultimately, it was the rheumatologist and the pulmonologist that made the diagnosis. She had a very high ANA level and a positive histone. And what she had was an anti-TNF-induced lupus-like syndrome. The treatment here is exactly the opposite of the last two cases. Remember, the last two we treated with infliximab. These two, we actually stopped infliximab, and we gave her a corticosteroid taper, and she improved over time. So again, sometimes infliximab helps, and sometimes it causes the disease. Now I want to move on, I think, to the most important area, which is opportunistic infections, including TB, atypicals, histoplasmosis, coccidiomycosis, aspergillus, legionella, and pneumocystis. Keep in mind, a negative tuberculin test does not exclude tuberculosis. 44 patients from the French Jetade cohort developed tuberculosis while on anti-TNF, and negative screening had been done in almost all these patients. Only one in three of the, one in three or 30% had a history of TB exposure, and when you look at the type of testing that was done, you had PPDs, you had the interferon gamma release assays like quantiferon, and you had 16% with both, and all of these got TB or developed TB despite screening. What were the symptoms? The symptoms are systemic. They're weakness and fatigue and fever, not as much cough. Weakness, fatigue, fever. It kind of blunts the pulmonary aspect. The disease location was largely extrapulmonary. Only 9% had disease in the lung only, 50% had lung and extrapulmonary, and 43% had extrapulmonary only, liver, spleen, pleural. And they held the anti-TNF, most responded to TB treatment, but at least one patient died of disseminated tuberculosis. Be careful. So now we're gonna move on to a few of these cases. So here's a 20-year-old female with Crohn's. She's stable on methotrexate and infliximab for five years, and she presents acutely with a number of symptoms, fevers, headaches, myalgias, dizziness, joint pains, anorexia, weight loss, a mild cough. She was paraflu positive during this workup, but she didn't really improve after weeks, and she was hospitalized for worsening symptoms. And then the medical student elicited the history that prior to the onset of illness, she was visiting her relatives who are farmers in Ohio. Actually, this is a fake slide. This patient actually does live in Ohio and is cared for by Wallace Crandall and Jen Dotson, for whom I think this slide. But the imaging findings were quite striking. She had these pulmonary nodules here, hyperinflation of the lung. Chest x-ray didn't show tons more than that. And ultimately, the diagnosis for her was histoplasmosis, which again, you need to be aware of, of the endemic areas. Over 250,000 Americans have been infected, found in Ohio and Mississippi. You get it by breathing in bird and bat feces. And it's really a disease of immunocompromised patients. Only 
of immunocompetent patients get infection. And this, just like the tuberculosis, can develop not only lung disease, but disseminated disease, liver, spleen, bone marrow, adrenals, meninges, untreated on immunosuppression patients can die. And this is a nice picture from Dr. Dotson's paper with histoplasma actually in a macrophage, which was really quite striking, disseminated histo. So you have to have a high uh, suspicion of diagnosis. Think about those multiple systemic symptoms. You can diagnose through serology and bronchoscopy, and then treatment is with antifungals, amphotericin, itraconazole. And don't wait the te for the test to come back if you strongly suspect it. You know, you're better off basically empirically treating than risking severe disseminated disease. Last case, 20-year-old male, one month of chronic cough. This one is from Massachusetts. Malaise, low-grade fever, and he'd spent his summer in a farm up in Maine. No exposure to tuberculosis, but once again, he basically had a persistent cough. He was referred to our pulmonology team. They got a CT, and we had a bronchoscopy. And what we saw in this bronchoscopy, again, on anti-TNF, you see all of this parenchymal disease. You see bronchiectasis here, if you can see it. There's a little arrow pointing to it, a circle for bronchiectasis. And he underwent a bronchoscopy, and then the finding resulted in withdrawal of his anti-TNF and treatment. And three months later, if you can see, his lungs were completely normal at that time. He did not have tuberculosis or histoblasmosis. What he had was an atypical mycobacterial infection with mycobacterium obsessus found in soil, dust, and water. And this can infect the skin, it can infect the lung, and it can cause systemic illness. There are other atypical mycobacterium, including mycobacterium avium. We all know this from our HIV patients. And I had a mom who has Crohn's who's on infliximab. Uh, her her uh, son also has it. And she got a fish hook in her while cleaning an aquarium. And she developed basically a severe cellulitis and uh, so-called mycobacterium marinum infection. So keep that in mind, and you need to have a very high index of suspicion. Do PPDs, biopsy these things, because again, the treatment is not with bacterial antibiotics, it's antimicrobial therapy. So, in conclusion, patients with inflammatory bowel disease will not infrequently present with pulmonary issues, either due to the disease itself, medications, or opportunistic infections have a high index of suspicion for lung disease, especially in cases of chronic cough. Don't be reassured by a negative PPD and chest X-ray. You might need pulmonary function tests, CT scan, lavage, or even lung biopsy, and have your pulmonologist on speed dial. Thank you very much.